Leonard Kirk, uh, Ty Templeton, and Adam Gorham. So give it up for these guys. Just, just for my own amusement, the Holmes Incorporated cover artist team together again for oh, the yeah. first time. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the only thing all three of us have worked on. I like it. <laughs> so was there any sort of agenda? Or you guys have any questions? Or? I have no agenda. I was, I was drafted into this about 20 minutes before I found out it was going on. <laughs> <laughs> I got the notice about two days ago, so okay. I, we're all in the same mm -hmm. boat. No, that's a dramatically different boat. I got I found out about this oh, yeah. about ten minutes ago, so I have no idea what the subject matter is. Is what did you, you guys want us to discuss? Well, I can say one thing that I um, that's kind of cool is just well, I love living in Canada. I enjoy you know my family moved up here. My dad was looking for work. Um, the whole Vietnam thing that was I was kidding but uh, m my dad was looking for work and we just got here and figured well we'll just spend two three years here and then move back to the States oh. and yeah that that went out the window <laughs> but uh, the one thing I do recall was when I started looking around for work started exploring the idea of, of getting into comics you know actually doing it um, this of course was back in the day you know, before, uh, I mean, small press, self-publishing, it existed, but my goal was to get into a more established publisher, hopefully the, you know, Malibu. the mainstream, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but my concern was, well, would I have to relocate, would I have to move to New York, would I have to move to California, and by then, thankfully, the business had become decentralized enough that even though we weren't using uh, email and and scans and stuff like that, but we still had the mail, we had FedEx, we had faxes, and so you could live pretty much anywhere, as long as you were able to get the work done and get it in on time. They didn't really give a crap where you were. In the, in the 80s, when I first started working and I told people what I did for a living, they did not believe that I was Canadian. That was sort of a weird part mm -hmm. of it. That you'd go, what do you do for a living? I draw Batman. Well, what are you doing here? Like, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be at a mall or something. And they go, well, I live here. And you draw Batman? And that seemed to disconnect in their yeah. brain that you had, that in some way, you had to live in New York City to do yeah. Batman. Because up until the 70s, you did. Yeah. You kind of did. But, That's why I was concerned, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, we broke in, I think, both of us in the 80s, right? Yeah. Well, uh, 90s for me, early 90s. Uh, okay. But the same, roughly the same Roughly the same. And, and, uh, yeah, that never even occurred to them that uh, we, we had to move. But I will tell you one very weird thing about my being a Canadian that you may not have had happen to you. Uh, one of the strangest rules that DC Comics uh, insisted upon, for me anyway, uh, I was not allowed to write and draw the same story for a character that belonged to Warner Brothers. I was allowed to write Batman stories for other people to draw, and I was allowed to draw Batman stories that other people wrote, but I was not allowed to write and draw the same story. And I, I asked why, because it seemed like such a weird rule, because John Byrne was allowed to do it. Um, uh, and so they said, oh, it's because you're a Canadian citizen. And the, the weird copyright laws are, if the entirety of the work is created outside the United States, the copyright doesn't automatically revert to the, to the publisher. Huh. And so, yep. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so during the period of time of writer-artists in the 90s and stuff like that, they either had to be American citizens or they had to incorporate outside of the country so that they hired themselves to write and right. draw the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't incorporate, so they wouldn't let me do it. Now, the funny thing was, Marvel Comics never mentioned this. The Simpsons never mentioned this. Everyone else I ever worked for never mentioned it. The only people who ever went, mentioned it were Warner Brothers. So I eventually got around to saying, are you sure this is right? <laughs> <laughs> because no other publisher gives me this restriction. Everybody yeah. else lets me write and draw my own stuff just fine. And so for a period of about four or five years, uh, I used to write and draw my own stuff all the time. And then we just pretend Mark Wade wrote it. <laughs> and this is absolutely true. Uh, there's about a, a dozen comic books you'll find that I did in my career that say by Mark Wade and Ty Templeton. And all Mark did was he read it and went, yeah, that was pretty good. I'll put my name on that. And, <laughs> and it was because I wasn't allowed to write them, but I did it anyway. And, and Mark was nice enough to be my beard. And the thing that's funny is Mark is a very talented writer. He certainly didn't need my attention to get him uh, uh, credits, but he was willing to uh, take the paycheck and, and then just turn around and send it to me. So, um, by the way, DC doesn't know this. You guys do, but they didn't at the time. So uh, every now and then, uh, Mark gets handed one of these things to sign, and he goes, I wish I could, but I didn't write it. Uh. <laughs> hmm. No, I mean, 
even as someone who grew up in Canada, I was absolutely floored the first few conventions I went to uh, in the area, especially in, around Toronto. I was floored by by you and by how many other Canadians, Canadians yeah. there were in, in, in comics, especially in mainstream comics. Toronto well. used yeah. to, it still does actually, has a, uh, a preposterously large contingent of pro comic book artists. It is, it is preposterous. Mm -hmm. None of the three of us live in Toronto. I live mm -hmm. well. We live on the same street, yeah. which is bizarre. <laughs> uh, Adam and I live twelve houses away from each other. It's pretty weird. Um, but in Mississauga, and you live in Kingston, right? No, St. Catharines. St. Catharines, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, but Toronto itself has about fifteen or twenty people who make their living making comics. Which, considering how few there are in North America, why are there twenty of them in Toronto? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the only thing I can come up with is drawing comics is an indoor sport. Yeah, and and because of the delightful winters we have here, um, we like to be indoors, and in a way that n most other you know if if you live in say uh, Florida, you're not drawing comics, you're out surfing, which explains yeah. why CrossGen failed. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it never occurred to me. <laughs> I thought it was the characters and the writing, but mm. it turned out to be <laughs> it turned out to be Florida. Uh, I have one other amusing Canadian story, um, our Canadian comic book story. Uh, some years ago, I was um, one of a bunch of people that were invited to a special luncheon with Joe Clark, mm. our former prime minister. Uh, he wasn't prime minister at the time, he was minister of culture. And he was uh, meeting a bunch of people who made art for a living. And I was somehow amongst that group. I don't know how I got in there, but I was. And uh, I was seated uh, directly to his left, where you're sitting right now. And uh, he turned to me fairly early in the luncheon, and he goes, uh, uh, so uh, uh, how do you find Canada? <laughs> because I don't, I don't know if he meant like since birth, it's been pretty cool. <laughs> uh, I think he thought I was American. I said, no, no, I'm not American, I'm, I'm a Canadian. And he goes, but, but you draw Batman. And again, same confusion. <laughs> And why would I, why would an American be at a luncheon with Joe Clark if he drew Batman? I just thought I'd wander into your country and announce Batman. <laughs> but I finally go, no, no, I, I'm a Canadian. And then he he took a second and went, the, why do you work for an American publisher then? And I said, because they pay me in fine American dollars. <laughs> and every time your government screws up, I get a raise. <laughs> and he did not find that anywhere near as funny as I did. <laughs> And that was the end of my conversation with Joe Clark. Uh, even though I was, as I said, directly to his left, he spent the rest of the luncheon like this. <laughs> Whoever the hell else was being talked to, it was not going to be me. Uh. But that's true. Every time we get paid American dollars, and every time the exchange rate mm -hmm. changes, you know, oh, that's, oh yeah, that's a new sink. Holy crap! Mm -hmm. Or you know, I, I've the back in uh, what, uh, the '90s when we used to get royalty checks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> back in the '90s, we used to get royalty checks. Uh, a royalty check of like I six. I still get them. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, st I I still do get them too, but for mm -hmm. the projects I do, they're kind of in the pennies. It depends. Well, yeah, I I haven't worked with DC for about twelve years. And yeah, I still get the occasional royalty check from them. And it's funny because it'll say like, it'll be a nice check. It'll be like, you know, an extra hundred bucks or whatever every now and then. But they send along a list because they itemize all the stuff that you have for the royalty. So it'll be like this five page document with about 500 different thingamajigs. We reprints, sold whatever. five in Argentina. Yeah, exactly. And it'll be, it'll be like three cents for this, yep. four cents for this, 10 cents for this, two cents for that. It'll add up to a hundred bucks. But yeah, I, I still get those royalty checks. I'm talking about yeah. real ones. Uh, when if, if, if you get a royalty check for like six grand or something and suddenly it turns into ten thousand dollars and I'm like wow that, yeah. that, that went from the rent to a car oh yeah <laughs> just I from the exchange rate I remember when uh, oh good grief it was amazing where I would walk in with like uh, with, with a five thousand dollar check and I go okay here we go and say okay at the exchange rate that's uh, seventy five hundred like whoa okay that's pretty good all you can buy with is Canadian things. It was, <laughs> there were only there were only two, maybe th I think no, I think it was only two years, and it was also at a period where, where, where the exchange rate was so low, combined with the fact that I was working my head off. But there were two years where I broke a hundred grand a year. I'd, I'd love to do that again someday, but that was just, but that just when I when I sat there adding my receipts, getting get ready to send everything off to my account, and I'm going. Like, Wait, is that that can't be right? And I go through it again and again. And, and he goes through the stuff and he converts it and he says, Nope, that's right. 
It's we like, should, holy moly. We should get a telethon <laughs> together so you can hit that mark again. <laughs> I know. I, I feel terrible that you that's, have it. Well, so I don't, we'll that's be, what, we'll be that working the phones. Me? Isn't what GoFundMe be for? That's, that's, that's what it's go for. Go thump me? Go fund me. Well, that too. Go thump. Well, I, yeah, I don't like that one. So I, sure. <laughs> go, go thump me doesn't have as much. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm going to turn to the third member of our panel who hasn't been as, who hasn't been as active in this conversation. Yeah. You've just recently become a major star at Marvel Comics. I'm brand new. You're a brand mm -hmm. new major star at Marvel Comics. How does that feel? Uh, it feels weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I've, uh, last year I worked on Rocket Raccoon, and this year I'm working on New Mutants. And I, New Mutants is a hell of a hell of a book. Yeah, it's really fun. I, uh, it's a mini. I don't know if anybody here is reading it, but it's a mini series, and I'll be working on the last issue next week. And beyond that, I don't know what I'm doing. Do you have to draw that dude with all the mechanics all over him? I suddenly forgot his name. Oh, Warlock. Warlock. Yeah. 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 What? How is it to even conceive of that character? He has no muscle structure. Uh, I, I, when I started drawing him for the book, I was told that I was drawing him too normal and rigid. Like he had, like he had bones. That he had bones. Yeah, and it made sense. Mm. And yeah, like, yeah. That's the thing about him. He's a Bill Sienkiewicz creation because Bill drew it like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was very conceptual. So I've <laughs> been. I, I don't know, I've, I've given it some form. It's like it's. It's oddly, it's oddly liberating because you just you get to be very cartoony with it, and it's mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Um, and I think that he's coming off. I mean, he hasn't been in the book much yet, but he's he's really he's he's, he's interesting, and I like it. Mm -hmm. Since we were talking about this before, have you felt your Canadianness while you do comics? Does this even occur to you? No, like I've. I'm, like I, when I started into comics, like all of this stuff has been pretty well established, right? Like they're. Oh, you mean like the characters you've been working on? Um, no, I just mean like coming up in the industry. You know, like I, uh, when I started out, Toronto had like a pretty vibrant comic scene, and as I was mentioning before, yeah, when you were younger, everybody in the universe who worked in comics lived in Toronto. Yeah, mm -hmm. and like everybody, everybody knows each other. Like I guess I kind of equate it to. Like if you're a kid coming into Xavier's mansion and there's already like a blue team and a gold team and <laughs> there's already like years of history, so you know none of this feels like there's all these things already in place. So like, it didn't feel weird being a Canadian in comics because there are already so many. And um, actually, nowadays one of the things that amazes me is uh, with Marvel, uh, they went through a huge international hiring period, mm -hmm. where you notice that every single new penciler on a Marvel book always had a vowel at the last part of their name. Okay. That it was all something something O or something something it, 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 because everybody was suddenly coming from uh, uh, yeah. Latin America or mm -hmm. or Brazil or something like that. Yep. And uh, uh, I found out why is because you pay them less. Yeah. Me personally. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't pay them at all. <laughs> but, but, but the Marvel uh, the Marvel were very happy to hire Argentinians and stuff like that because they got they get a lower page rate than we do. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I learned too. Yeah. And that's sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exactly the same reason for the, yeah the big Filipino uh, thing in the '70s when you had those uh, fantastic Filipino artists mm -hmm. is because you could pay them less. Yeah, and uh, although some of the work was so like, um, like some of the old Gold Key Star Trek comics from you know some folks uh, in I guess in what was another Alberto no, I think it was in Spain Al Al was, uh, Alberto Giamatti he was yeah, Italian. Italian. You're Italy, walking into my right. territory yeah. here. I have a complete run of those. And I just and I remember seeing some of those when I was younger and and, and it just. They, you know, that doesn't look like what is on the show, but then at the same time, I thought some of it, it's like, some of it looks better than what's on the show. It's pretty cool. The transporter room in the Giamatti yeah. comics is the, it's like something from Forbidden Planet. It's the mm -hmm. weirdest thing in the yeah. entire world. Also, that I love in the Enterprise and the Giamatti comics, it fires uh, yes. flaming rockets out the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because he'd never yeah. seen the show. I don't know no. how he got out of this. No, it, but it hadn't been. Yeah, it hadn't been released. It had in Italy never been yet. released in Italy. And yeah. all, all he had was a set of twelve photographs right. of the main actors. Mm -hmm. So every issue they would get into that pose because that was the only one he yes. had of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and by page four, Scotty and, and Captain Kirk completely interchangeable. You had no yes. idea which one oh, was yeah. which. Anyway, <laughs> those weren't Canadian. They were Italian. No. More Canadianness. Uh, right. Who here's reading Captain Canuck? Hmm? Go ahead. When you first started um, getting into comics and being Canadian, I did both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always good. Yeah. Um, how did you find trying to get your work noticed by 
you know, the American companies like DC and Warner Brothers in, and all that. In my particular case, my being Canadian was actually probably a tremendous asset. I'll tell you why. Because uh, there was a little comic book company in Toronto called Vortex Comics okay. that was run by uh, the scumbag of the earth, a guy named Bill Marks. If anybody ever sees him, shoot on sight. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but they're not so strict that you're not allowed to take vermin out. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit like, you know, you can shoot rats at a junkyard. Same thing. And, uh, but he, he was a local publisher in Toronto. And because I was actually living in Toronto at the time, um, uh, it was very easy to just walk in off the street with samples for this guy and just go, hey, I heard you publish comics. I like comics. Here's comics. I drew comics. And um, the first thing I brought him uh, was um, just samples of uh, pages of like X-Men and stuff like that, just drawings of other characters. And he said, hey, you're pretty good. You want to do a story for us? And I did. And after the first story, he offered me his own series, my own series. So I wouldn't have had that zoom of a climb if I was not in the very same city with this small publisher existed. If I was, you know, if I had to drive 40 miles or something like that, or, or it, it might have been burdensome to do it. And I was... Uh, just literally walking distance from this publisher. So I, I walked in to do it. And then again, because of the small world that the comics were, uh, I was uh, sitting in the outer office one day to bring my work in for like issue three of the book I was doing. And uh, the guy who was editor in chief of the company was a guy named Ken Stacy. Anybody know Ken Stacy? Yeah, okay. Uh, and then Ken Stacy and Bill Marks were having an argument because Ken's a human being and Bill Marks is scum. And um, uh, at the end of the argument, Ken threw his hands up and stormed out of the room. And Bill, or stormed out of the building actually, and Bill uh, came out into the outer office after, you know, three or four minutes and found me out there because I was delivering the art for the next issue. And uh, he goes, uh, you coming to my office. What are you doing right now? Uh, I was going to go home. You want to make a few phone calls? Why? You, you want to be editor? Okay. And <laughs> and I was suddenly editor-in-chief of Vortex Comics because, <laughs> because the guy in front of me had quit and I was in the hall. And uh, <laughs> if, if Leonard had been in the hall, his career would have been a very different thing wow. than it is now. And so I was editor of Vortex and Comics. And Marx would definitely be dead. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Because I came from America. My problem, my problem is, is every time I would do this, I would talk myself out of it. But um, uh, uh, the first, literally, the first day I was there, I was having a phone call with um, uh, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz on the phone. He was talking to Bill within the first day. Uh, about a week later, I was talking to uh, Steve Ditko because Steve Ditko mm -hmm. did some work for us, and uh, I felt like I was in the comics industry, bam, that fast because I, I was, I was now talking to industry greats. I was responsible for a publishing schedule to be met. Um, uh, I was dealing with the scum of the earth and learning what that was like. That after, after working for Bill Marks at Vortex, there is no place on earth you can ever work where you go, oh, this is a terrible job. Because <laughs> you've been through the worst thing ever. Anyway, so by being part of a Canadian publisher is what really started my career because I was at Vortex for two years. And during that two years, I wrote a character called Mr. X, which became fairly popular. I don't know how many people remember Mr. X, but I did that. And I did a couple of other projects here and there. And as I said, I got to work with these people so that when later on I was over at uh, DC Comics, I ran into Bill Sienkiewicz and I knew him. He wasn't just some schmuck that, you know, I'm some schmuck in the hallway that's that's trying to irritate the people at DC. I was now one of the gang. I was part of the team. I was I was part of the industry. And so my being in a small town with a small publisher had everything, not small, but in a local town with a local publisher had everything to do with that. And hopefully that kind of stuff is happening for somebody in Kentucky right now. There might be some small publisher in Kentucky that gives somebody their first chance, so. Yeah. Have you always lived there, or did you have the same chance of living in Toronto first to get started? And no, I've, I've lived in St. Catharines first the whole time, and Niagara on the Lake uh, for a couple of years, but yeah, I've, I've never lived in Toronto. Um, I didn't have that same experience, uh, but for me, being in Canada didn't really have that much of an impact in terms of, you know, having difficulty or, or making it easier. Uh, I simply did what a lot of people did in those days, which was to do up some samples and send them off to as many publishers whose addresses I could find. And I remember standing at the post office and uh, 
licking eighty dollars worth of stamps <laughs> and, and sending out a dozen, then buying a two liter bottle of Pepsi to wash that. Out of my mouth. You really got to know the back of the queen's head. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that crown is sharp. <laughs> but, but, Honestly, when I met the queen, the first thing I said to her, "You don't look at all like you do on the stamps." <laughs> But uh, no, I just sent them off, and I was very fortunate. Uh, I mean, I got some rejection letters. I expected that. But uh, a couple publishers said, hey, we're interested. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, this early stuff didn't pay much, but I didn't really care about that. I just wanted to get started and get my name in print and get going. And, and that, that's what they gave me. The one funny thing, though, was that two publishers contacted me. The first one was interested in my writing. Because at the time, I didn't know anything about, you know, some publishers will offer you for people who want to do samples, they'll thing, offer things like sample scripts and whatever. And if you go online, there's some publishers that, that will still do that, and they'll tell you how to do that. But uh, I, I didn't know anything about that. So I just wrote my own stories to, so I'd have something to draw. The other thing they tell you is only send maybe, you know, five or six pages at the most. I sent 20. <laughs> one 12 page Here, story. Here's the huge <laughs> difference. The reason you're supposed to only send five or six pages is because after page three, you can tell pretty well if this guy's anything. Yeah. And, and it becomes burdensome to have to go through so many pages. But 20 pages of Leonard Kirk artwork is never going to be a problem. Because 20 pages of Leonard Kirk artwork is always going to be nice. Well, back then, I don't know. But anyway, I, I, sent, I sent this stuff in. And uh, the one publisher liked the story that I wrote and, and said, what else have you got? And I, I've got nothing. I only, I only wrote those so I'd have something to draw. But if uh, Malibu, that's the one I wound up working with, if they hadn't called uh, when they did, uh, I was probably like this close, you know, I, I would have jumped in and said, well, I'll give it a shot. And my career might have gone a completely different direction. Right. So who knows? Yeah, I, I became a writer for almost the same reason. I became a writer because I didn't think I was much of an artist when I was a kid. And I wrote stories uh, and then I would draw them to show the artist what I wanted them to look like. And mm -hmm. um, uh, every now and then the artist would go, you should just draw yourself. And <laughs> it didn't occur to me that anybody ever wanted to see me draw it because I'm the opposite of Leonard. I thought of myself as a writer who just drew to get the stories across mm. and ended up getting work first stuff i ever saw you do yeah uh was teuton but i think mm -hmm. before that you did vampire diaries right the vampire conspiracy vampire conspiracy <laughs> i'm sorry i got the word uh, vampire in there but I got the rest of it wrong. Uh, uh how did those help you get discovered because oh my god if you guys have ever seen teuton whoa is it beautiful oh thanks um how, well i i met you and i was working on um an independent book called The Vampire Conspiracy that was sort of written by a, 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 a guy who directed commercials and he wanted to make features. And so he made this really low budget horror film on a shoestring budget and it wasn't very good and he decided to better market it as a graphic novel. So he hired me to do it and I was working on it. Well, how did you get that? He hired me to do it. It seems like just such a hell of a jump. Oh, yeah. You were sorry. wandering a bus station. Yeah. And then you're you! Bearing, you're bearing the lead. Yeah. <laughs> how did he know you were that good? I, I was, um, so I had gone to art school uh, for a year, and it nothing really took, and so I stopped going to art school and was working warehouse jobs and a lot of stuff like that, and it kind of, what I wasn't enjoying it, and I decided if I was going to do comics, I should just dive into it and find work. So I left my job and went online and looked for uh, work as a comic artist on Craigslist at first as a start because I just didn't know how to find work and at this point in my life... But that led to the Vampire Chronicles? Yeah. Like at that point I had never even been to a comic convention. I was a very late bloomer as far as like getting into comics goes. Like I, I had read comics and I loved comics but I had never been a part of the scene. Um, so. I just didn't know where to begin and so I went online and looked for jobs where like you might look for other kinds of jobs like Craigslist or Monster or wherever and a lot of the artist jobs were like sandwich artists at Subway and Mr. Sub. <laughs> uh, yeah. I still get, I'll still get like Monster things. <laughs> in my junk box saying like we've you know there's like these uh, several jobs with like artists in the name and they're all, they're all like sandwich artists <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate so there was like only a couple of ads seeking comic book artists and his was one of them and so I contacted him and I drew a sample page and he liked it and 
Uh, truth be told, I might have been like the only person who responded. I don't Which know. is amazing because if, if you're setting it on Craigslist, the likelihood that he's going to get somebody with your skill level is insanely unlikely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. He, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I thought I was fine at the time, but I didn't think I was like terrific. Um, and I, like, at that time, I had drawn, uh, like maybe eight pages of sequential art total, like all told, like a four-page story here and a four-page story there. I drew five pages for Marvel back when they still took mail-in submissions and mm -hmm. got a very polite rejection. Was that the Vision story? No, this was like Spider-Man and Daredevil shows up in Venom. Oh, they, they used to have a standard Vision story that they asked people to draw. Oh, this I just like I just drew. Some Someday nonsense. I would love them to publish all the versions of that five-page story. With <laughs> oh, it, it was yeah. the, it was, have you ever seen it? No, it, no, it, but. It, it's a specific story they used to send fun. out yes. for people, and, and I've seen like seven or eight different versions of it as people yeah. give me portfolios. I would go, oh, the vision story. I've seen that. That would be cool. And that's one of the reasons by, I mentioned before about sample scripts. Um, th there are two reasons. One, it gives the artist something to draw, but also it gives the publisher a good idea. That, you know, they can compare different people, see how each one draws that same scene, mm -hmm. and say, well, this person does it best. So, so, everybody has their own interpretation of the story. Yeah. You better. If mm -hmm. your interpretation it doesn't look distinctive, we don't need you. Right. The whole the the thing I always say about art: art is about um, uh, being comfortable with your imperfections, being comfortable with what makes you human. The the I'm really comfortable. Yeah, but no, <laughs> but but then again, that is literally your genius. That is what makes you wonderful. Because anybody could take a, a cup and trace a circle with it, and no one would care because it was done by a, me a mechanism. But if I take my hand and I draw a circle and it's imperfect, you see the hand of the artist there and it's present. And what art is, or what style really is, is embracing your imperfections. And so there's this weird thing that we fight our whole lives to get rid of our imperfections, and that's of course mm. taking us further and further from our style. It, 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 you become more sterilized when you when you take the uh, hand of the artist out. I want to ask you though, did Vampire Chronicles did that get you Fred's attention, Fred Kennedy's attention, or? Uh, yeah. Who was the guy? By the way, Fred Kennedy is a guy that wrote uh, Teuton. He's a disc jockey in New, uh, in Toronto. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And because um, yeah. Teuton was a hell of a thing. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, like I, when I was working on that, um, I, uh, you looked at the, at my vampire work at the time, and you were running, uh, you, I think you were just running the Tur Toronto Cartoonist Workshop then, it was yet to be your boot camp. So I had the benefit of um, working on work while also learning. So I was doing your workshops, taking everything that I learned and going home and then putting it into the actual work that I was doing. And then once, um, you know, once we had this, once I had this self-published book under my belt, I was then able to go to shows and hand it to people, show it around, and um, talk to independent writers and stuff like that. And I got in touch with Fred because after I had this book and I now like had boxes of this thing, I had to like hopefully like sell it somehow. So I was driving around the GTA, like basically showing up at comic shops asking if they'd want to take my book on consignment. And the whole time I was driving, I was listening to Fred on the radio who was new to Toronto at the time. And he was saying on air how he liked comics. <laughs> and so like he would talk about Green Lantern and whatever and so he and I had this bright idea to uh, get him to plug my book. So I went home and I wrote him an email saying like, I know you like comics, would you be so kind as to look at my book? Maybe talk about it on air or whatever. And he wrote back to me saying that he actually wanted to write and make comics and if I'd be interested in drawing one with him instead of like, you know, him, him reading my book, and so that's how Two Tongue got started. So that has that has a lovely mm. proactive part to the story, that you approached Fred. I actually I, I find that interesting. I didn't know that part of the story. Yeah, I was. Um, I have no problem with like emailing people about things and asking them questions. A number of years ago, I had a similar experience that led to a really wonderful job for me for a while. Uh, I was sitting at home. I used to draw this comic book called Stig's Inferno. Please don't look it up. It's horrible. But when um, I was working on issue five one day, uh, I'm watching television, and there used to be this thing uh, in Toronto. If anybody was around Toronto in the mid-'80s, there was this thing called Late Great Movies. It was hosted by a guy named Bob Segarini, which was on from uh, uh, 2 to 6 in the morning. And it was just Bob. Uh, uh, every 20 minutes he would come on and he would give out prize money and uh, you know uh, talk about the movie and stuff like this and I used to watch it because I was up all night working and uh, one day they came out of a commercial and he's reading issue 4 while I'm drawing issue 5 and I just thought that was so amusing <laughs> that as I'm drawing the comic book they came out of a commercial and he had the, the thing right up on the camera because he was a comic fan too and I, this so amused me I called the station because once again I was in Toronto and this was City TV and I called the station and I went your host is holding up the comic book I draw on the air I want to talk 
talk to him. So uh, 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 I left a message for him, and he called me the next day, and he said, oh, you should come on down. This is my Bob Seger impression. You should come on, <laughs> you should come on down to the, uh, to the studio. We'll have you on as a guest tomorrow. That'd be great. We'll, we'll, we'll interview you. It'd be fun. So in between my getting that phone call and me coming out of the studio, uh, my father used to work in television. I, I know a lot about television. And so I said to myself, I like the show that Bob's on, but it can be greatly improved. So I, I wrote a bunch of producer's notes for how to improve the set, uh, how to, uh, uh, how, there, I wrote a sketch that he should do. Uh, I more or less said, you know, the producers should get on the, the host because he's doing this and he shouldn't do this. And I just wrote this huge pile of notes about how to improve this television show, like the asshole of all time. And, <laughs> Uh, when I got to this, uh, when I got to the studio, and he interviewed me, and I handed him this file full of notes, and he goes, well, "What are these?" And I went, "Oh, it's some notes about your show." And he goes, "Oh," and he threw them in the garbage, <laughs> like, like a normal person would. But I didn't, I didn't know he threw them in the garbage. He said, "Thanks, I'm really going to go over these and read them. This will be the biggest part of my night." Um, but he threw them out in the garbage. But uh, by delightfully good luck, the garbage he threw them out, the the actual garbage can he threw it out was what the was the producer's garbage can. Uh, who showed up for work the next day at 8 in the morning and fished them out and went, who wrote these? These are great. And, <laughs> and uh, I, was, uh, I was hired to produce the show. <laughs> Uh, where I where I produced the show for six months, and uh, if anybody was in Toronto at the time, they used to see me on the air all the time because I used to come on and play characters and be and bit parts. And oh my God, did Bob resent that? Uh, because I went from being his guest to his boss. Pretty much. But um, it was it was genuinely the same proactive thing, which is I just thought. Who who would want me to do that? No one would. No one on earth would walk, want you to walk into the office and go, "Hi, I know none of you, but you're fucking up your job." Uh, here's here's how I would improve it. And then the expectation that anybody would do anything with it was pretty remarkably low, but they did. And so, uh, you know, exactly like you, you just went, "Hey, Fred." Come promote my comic for me. Why would somebody think that that's going to work out? But it does when yeah. you do it. And you ended up doing like I don't know, twelve issues of two times, something like that. You did three, three trades. Three yeah, the three trades. Oh, wow. But each trade is about what? About well, yeah, six issues. Yeah, but so, equal yeah. to that. Uh, if you guys have not seen Two Times, go to. Do you have any to sell this no. weekend? No, you don't. It's been quite a while. I know, but it's so beautiful, and I want people to see it. <laughs> I know your recent stuff is, of course, gorgeous too. But it, uh, it's the first, it's the first stuff that I was just blown away by how good you were when I start when I saw that stuff. At some point, find it online. There, <laughs> I'm pimping the stuff from five years ago. They just want me to do. <laughs> uh, I had the, almost the same thing. Uh, well, not quite a similar thing when I was drawing uh, Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. Uh, I was the the regular artist on the book for a couple of years, but uh, they had multiple series, uh, special editions, blah blah blah, and so I would also do covers for a bunch of the other titles, and I always liked my titles to have something to do with the story, so I'd say, you know, send me all the scripts. At least that was partly the reason I wanted it. I was also a continuity nut, and like any Trekkie, uh, almost any Trekkie, and so. Uh, the other reason I wanted them to send me the scripts was so I could go through and pick out all the mistakes. Because I would constantly see things slip through, even on the books that I was working on, things in the script that didn't make sense. And so <clears throat> I would start sending in notes and blah, 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 something here, something there. And at one point, it, it reached a point where I, I, I was rewriting some of the dialogue and I was saying maybe something should change here to make this. And I wound up having an issue where I rewrote an entire page because it just didn't make sense from this part of the story to this part of the story to say you need something right in the middle here to make this follow through so it would explain why the Romulans went from here to here to here and how they did this and blah, blah, blah. And it was at that point the editor called me up and said, would you like to write this stuff? <laughs> and, so, and so I wound up doing that. Unfortunately, it was only one issue because Malibu lost the license. I had a half dozen other stories I was getting ready to work on, but I, I, I started working on this one, and it was funny because uh, they're saying, well, what will we do? And I said, well, I'll, we'll have Dax go to the Klingon homeworld. At that time, they hadn't shown it that much on the TV shows, <coughs> any of them. And so I thought, well, let's go and do that. And well, what would be your reason? Well, we could have it tie into that episode where we met, where we had Kang, Koloth, and Kor show up. And, uh, and my, my uh, editor said, oh, that, that's great. She could be going back to the Klingon homeworld to visit her, uh, uh, to visit her godson. And I said, yeah, she could be doing that if it wasn't for the fact that he died 80 years earlier. That was the whole point of that episode <laughs> where they avenged his death. Whatever. Anyway, he said, okay, well, we'll work on that. And the plan was for the two of us to write this. But Paramount, and this is 
dealing with licensed properties like this, and it's something I'm I'm relearning again, working with Star Wars now. I can, I, I kind of I remembered all the fun stuff. I forgot. Oh, that's I forget. why you get royalty checks. <laughs> <laughs> you working on Star Wars? Well, now. I haven't got any of those yet. Uh, but uh, it, my my Star Wars stuff hasn't even come out yet. But oh. uh, uh, but Talk it, about a space in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anywho, the one of the downsides working with licensed properties like that is that the studio, you know, Paramount, they just go over everything and and they take forever for approving things. And so I would send in my synopsis, and I knew it was just going to take forever. Um, so I went ahead and just started writing without the editor. I just went ahead and and by the they, by the time we got word said. Editor said, "Yeah, we're good to go. Uh, let's get started writing." I said, "I've got my second draft. Here you go." And he, and he looked it over. He was a little disappointed we couldn't work on it together. He said, "Yeah, okay, this looks fine." <laughs> you know. So and and I was thrilled with it. It was the one issue that I that I wrote, I penciled and inked it. And so and they never thanked me for all the ink that I saved, all the money I saved them on ink because they only had to print one. The one person on the title or on the cover. Uh, so, but, uh, hey, at Malibu, that was the margin they were working on. Yeah. The amount of ink it takes to print two I know. more names. But unfortunately, that was, but, but yeah, I just, it started with me complaining and, and saying, you know, hey, let's do this. And th because there were so many things, even the, the editors and some of the writers were missing, I was just going on and on about continuity. And then that I wound up writing it. And unfortunately, if we hadn't lost the license, I might have written that thing for a year or more. I don't know. It would have been fun. There's constantly stories about writing just being put in stop and you were about to become a writer. I know. Go write something tomorrow. I, I've already started. Okay. I've, I've actually, I've got one that I'm, I was asked, it, I think it was right here actually, now, last year, everyone was asked what kind of a, what character you would like to work with and, uh, you know, with whatever publisher with, well, I'm with Marvel, but the one character I really want to do some work with, and you will know this one because you've talked about him before, is uh, actually a DC character, Arm, oh. arm Fall Off Boy. <laughs> I, I was just thinking, and, and I started thinking, you know what I would like to do with him? Wait a second, and I does anybody know who this is? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, but the name is fantastic. He is someone who applied to become a member of the Legion, Legion of Superheroes, Superheroes and was rejected. His power is yeah. he can pull one arm off and beat you with it. Yeah, I, no, actually, yeah, and, and, and am, actually, it could be either arm. I'm, it's just yeah, you know, no, it's either arm. I'm enormous, but it's only one because you know once you pull one, you can't do the. Opposite. I'm enormous. <laughs> I am enormously proud of my contribution to to fall arm fall off. Boy. He's he's only ever I'm, and actually, you know what's what, what very funny? Yeah. Spotting a continuity error is why he exists. Mm. Because here's what happened. I was I was uh, uh, inking an issue of the Legion of Superheroes, which was the secret origin of the, the Legion Clubhouse. And the original story was uh, uh, written by, it doesn't matter, and uh, drawn by Kurt Schaffenberger, and I was the inker on it. And as I was inking the book, I was reading it. Because, you know, not all inkers ignore what the story is. I was actually reading along as I was inking it. And I got to page six, and I went, oh my god, there's a horrific continuity error here. You can't publish this story. It's got a giant problem with it. And it turns out the original story of what the Legion Clubhouse was, anybody remember the old Legion Clubhouse? It looked like a rocket accident. Yeah. It looked like a rocket just went plunk into the ground and they just moved in like a house. And that was the story. It turned out there was a rocket accident. That's why it looked like a rocket sticking out of the ground. It was an actual <laughs> rocket accident. Yeah. But it was a rocket from Krypton, which is why they made it the Legion Clubhouse, is because it was an indestructible building. And you find out in the concept of the story that's, that Jarrell puts the baby into uh, the, the rocket, <laughs> sends it off without noticing the rocket also has a monkey and a dog hidden in it because that's what happened but um, uh, when it when it gets into orbit he then goes oh I should send the second rocket after him with supplies and blankets and food and Klingon libraries so that he will grow up uh, not Klingon uh, Krypton yeah. he will grow up a fine Kryptonian boy so he takes the next rocket which is six stories tall <laughs> yeah and he and his wife don't bother getting in it. Or any other Kryptonians. <laughs> no. They just fill it with blankets and food. And, and like all I could think of was inking this, inking this page that why wasn't there people bound, pounding on Jarrell's door yes. going, bring my family! The boy will need blankets. Fuck off. And, and so 
I, I, I called the editor up and I went, you guys realize this makes Jarrell a psychopath. Yeah. That he would, that he would, that he would have even sent the kid in the first rocket. Oh yeah, and the first rocket, by the way, room for two. Right. Well, you know, no, originally there was room for Lara, and she says, I would rather exactly. die with you right. than raise my child, like yeah. every mother would say. Yeah. It's like it worked for Moses. Yeah, that's right. And can, can you tell that story was written by two men? <laughs> yes. Because you have a woman with an infant child, and she's going, infant child, I'm dying with a man. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the idea that he sent the first rocket in the first place was meaningless, because he had a functioning six-story rocket. What the yeah. first rocket was for, I don't know. The first rocket should have been for the monkey and the dog. The baby did not need to be in it. Yeah. So I send them, I, I, I call them up, and I go, uh, 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 I, Jerry, you've written this story, it's a big mistake, you gotta fix it. And I just thought we were gonna come up with a way of fixing it. I thought it was going to be that it was an experimental rocket that didn't work and when Krypton blew up, it was sort of catapulted towards Earth, right, I don't know. Right. But uh, they rewrote the story completely from the ground up oh. and threw the original story away. And it was a 15-page story that I think by Kurt Schaffenberger that to this day has never been published. <laughs> um, although um, I did eventually scan the pages and put them up online because I wanted people to read it because it was such a funny story to me. <laughs> and um, so when they started the new story, it was going to be about a kid who tries out to be a member of the Legion whose superpower is that he can turn into a rocket ship. <laughs> oh, yes. Don't you remember that? <laughs> and he was called... And, and But uh, yeah. it's even sillier. What, I'm going to save for the end of this what his real name turned out to be. Uh, but he could turn into a rocket ship. And during the course of this adventure, uh, he is killed uh, while in his rocket ship form. So um, oddly enough, they decide to honor him. They will live inside his corpse. <laughs> Again, biblical wor reference. Work for yeah, Jonah. Work for Jonah. No, he wasn't a corpse for Jonah. <laughs> no, that's true. Uh, but like at a certain point, you just want to go, every time you're redecorating, this used to be his lungs, man. Like, <laughs> And uh, uh, they name him Fortress Lad <laughs> in honor of the, the one adventure he comes along and he dies, and he dies in his fortress form. So they, like, honestly, who wouldn't say that? Oh, my God, he died in a form large enough for us to gut him and get inside. <laughs> You're in. Um, uh, so the story, anyway, during that story, we all got to suggest uh, uh, one of the other legionnaires that, that showed up mm -hmm. to do the thing. And I'm, I'm deeply proud of Iron Fall Off Boy, um, which was my contribution to that. And uh, he was voted uh, by Hero Magazine in something like 2000 as the worst character <laughs> of the millennium. I... <laughs> no, I'm not actually kidding yeah. about that. They did a list of the worst characters and they, they voted Arm Fall Off Boy the worst character of the millennium. Oh, and that's, I loved him. And that's why there, I de I, I've decided that, I decided to do it at first as just an ex just a writing exercise because I haven't done much writing for a while. So I thought, well, okay, well, go with the story. And, and, and what I wanted to do was carry on the story because they did bring him back for some other stuff at DC. I, I was they, stunned when they, he came back. They revamped him a little bit and I haven't read all of it, but I've seen some of it and I didn't really like it that much. So I really want to carry him back to where he was, where he was this big, boisterous, very egotistical <laughs> was, sort of person. The, the roots of our fall yeah. off point. And, 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 <laughs> but, but at the same time, what happened to him afterwards and I figure, what career would he go on to once rejected from the? And what could he do if he could whip, pull off his arm, hit people? And I thought, professional wrestler. That's it. He's going to be a professional wrestler, and uh, still living on Earth. And he gets, he gets kind of wasted one night. He's with some, uh, with, with, with some, uh, 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 oh, uh, one of my groupies. And uh, you know how occasionally somebody, you know, you might lose your phone in his cap. Well, he wakes up the next morning, realizes he, hey, where's my left arm? <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the story begins. <laughs> oh okay, since, since we got onto the subject of most embarrassing Legionnaire characters, I wrote the Legion for a while, which is why I got the, the thrill of getting to write Arm Fall Off Boy. But um, uh, my favorite Legion character that never got to print, you guys are going to love this guy, he was a character who could turn into furniture at will. <laughs> and... We haven't even. Oh no, it. not IKEA, man. No, it's so much more, <laughs> so much, so much more wonderful than that. Uh, 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 but only two kinds of furniture. You could turn into an armchair or a sofa. That was it. And and what was really horrible about them is they had skin and hair and stuff. They were. <laughs> 
they, they weren't like soft velvety cushions that with like you were clearly aware this was an organic being and um, so he tries out for the I, I used to write there there was a, a, a Legion spinoff book called the Legion of Substitute Heroes Does anybody ever remember this which was the Legionnaires who got rejected for the real Legion and these were the basic fuck up Legionnaires and their premise was that the Legion got sick they would show up like substitute teachers right. and uh, I wrote the Legion of Subject Heroes for a while, and uh, I tried to get this character into the Legion of Subject Heroes, and his name was Sofa King. And <laughs> wait for it. <laughs> the thing about Sofa King was that he had he had uh, uh, groupies, like you were mentioning, because yeah. he was really handsome. And so whenever they would fight crime, they would uh, uh, the, uh, his fans would ch surround the Legion, and they would chant, "We're Sofa King crazy." <laughs> We're so fucking crazy. And the editor did not get the joke, because in print, <laughs> you can't tell that's what they're saying. Right. That's, by the way, it's the only reason I named him Sofa King, because <laughs> in the original version of the script, he was chair boy. But <laughs> when I realized that Sofa King had a lovely pun to it, I couldn't Ooh. help myself. And uh, he was going to appear in a four issue miniseries that got canceled uh, because Mark Wade was the editor and Mark Wade got fired and, he, and all of his projects got swept under the rug. But Mark did not notice the joke. He let me go through with it and I had two issues with Sofa King in it. He is still my favorite character I've ever played. Because, uh, you know, no one cares for Chairboy, but Sofa King, holy cow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm hmm. <laughs> Uh, I have I have one other story about correcting something and how it went wrong though. Mm -hmm. that, that was the one about correcting something and it became a, a, a wonderful Legion story yeah. that led to this character. You like? Uh, I was working at one point. I used to uh, do the Wildcats for uh, Image Comics, and uh, I was drawing an issue of the Wildcats. And the the the, the writer for it was a friend of Jim Lee's. Jim's not in the room. Yes, okay. Uh, who shouldn't have been a writer? He was uh, somebody who I believe was Jim's dentist. And uh, Jim went, yeah, you can write comics. Because um, back in Image, that's all you needed was to, at some point, put your finger in Jim's mouth and you could have a job. And the, <laughs> the script this guy had written was just awful. And the premise of the story was this guy had built uh, an earthquake machine and a big, giant Kirby machine somewhere. Well, I designed it, so that's why it was a Kirby machine. But it was a big, giant earthquake machine. And at some point, he's going to pull the lever and <laughs> earthquakes, and everybody's going to die. And so in the concept of the story, he brings the earthquake around with him like on a Winnebago and threatens local cities that if they don't give him a million dollars, he's going to have an earthquake go off and they have to give him money. And so uh, the story was about the Wildcats solving this problem. And uh, when I got the script and I'm reading it, I'm turning the pages and I get to page 20, which is the end of the story, and I went, the machine never went off. The, during the whole course of the story, the, the Wildcats show up as he's threatening New York and he stops them or they stop him. And the machine never turns on. And I couldn't believe that a writer would do something that dumb. That there's a rule in theater, it's called Chekhov's gun, which is if you bring a gun on stage, you must fire it because the audience is furious at you to do that to them. You don't tease like that and not fire the gun. So I said to the editor, this is Chekhov's earthquake machine. You don't bring the earthquake machine on stage and not fire it. That's silly. And he went, no, that's the script. Draw it like it's supposed to be. So uh, when I got to page 15, that damn thing went off. <laughs> I didn't mean to, I, you know, but it went off, and a whole bunch of cities started crumbling, and bits of the Chrysler building started falling over. And uh, um, uh, I, I still drew the story that was written for me. The, the, the Wildcats still do what they're supposed to do in the end. But um, you know, who wouldn't turn off the earthquake machine? Right. It just seemed like such a preposterous thing not to. Uh, but because I called the office and asked, and they said no, and I did it anyway. Yeah. They were mad at me, uh. and that's why I don't draw the Wildcats anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So sometimes we've been telling these stories of correct it when you know it's wrong and good yeah. rewards will come to you. And other times it will be, so what are you doing for a living now? Because it's not working here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that a few times. I've, I've had, and thankfully they've mostly almost always worked out fine where uh, I, I might look at something and say, hey, you know, call the editor or the writer or someone and say, hey, do you think maybe instead of having the character do this, we have the character do this because I think that would be more visually interesting or something like this, blah, blah, blah. And they'll go, yeah, hey, that's a great idea. And my response nine times out of ten is good because I drew it that way anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, if they said no, I'd just 
redraw it. You know? <laughs> but it, but I, thankfully, I, most of the time they were th they were cool with it. So. I would have redrawn the Wildcat story if they knew they were that mad. <laughs> 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 it went out like that. You can buy it. It's like, the the it's one like, thing that did go out that was really weird, and I've told the story before. Uh, it's it's one of the dumbest things that I ever did, but. It's it's not the worst, craziest thing that anyone in the comics ever did. I couldn't even come close to that. But this was very, very early in my career. It was only the second series I was ever worked working on. It was uh, tying to the Alienation TV series. And there was this scene where we were in an alley, and it's this, you know, <coughs> drug uh, alley, garbage, graffiti on the wall, all this stuff. I used to live near there. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you were in the background. But there was... <laughs> Uh, this big wall and graffiti on it and I put it in the alien language and then had graffiti in English as well a big mixture and in big bold letters easily visible just for the heck of it I put down for a good time call Tom that was the name of my editor <laughs> and at dot 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 and I put Malibu's actual office <laughs> phone number <laughs> Figuring the editor's gonna spot this and he's go, oh that Leonard, hey we got it, whatever, something like that. So I sent it in, and then nothing. I don't hear anything. Uh, Terry Pallet inked it and inked it straight. Get, get to whatever. Didn't hear anything. Did, and I'm about to call and say, hey, did you guys get? Me? But then I'm thinking, oh, what if they're mad at me or something like that, and they just don't want to sound it, or I don't know what's it. But he, I, certainly that won't come out that can't be published the book comes out there it is it's right there in print and the only thing that saved my butt is that the office moved two weeks right before that comic came out and they changed their number and i to this day i do not know if anyone ever called it i never pulled any crap like that again it was just i did i, I did an issue of i did an issue of a series called blue devil does anybody remember blue devil yep and there was a scene in it where um, some creature is being summoned by the elder gods. That's all I was asked to do. And it was just supposed to be just a big ring of elder gods. And I was, whatever I want that to be, just people with horns and bat wings or whatever. And uh, it was a lineup of about 20 or 30 of these characters standing in front of this open fire pit. And I was the penciler, not the inker. I think the inker was Al Gordon. And uh, I just, for a laugh, so Al Gordon could laugh at this, I drew amongst the elder gods Thor and Odin. Not, <laughs> not even slightly not in their full yeah. Marvel costumes and it was just so Al Gordon would go ha ha and fix it but he did not he, <laughs> he inked them as Thor and Odin and the part that cracks me up is the colorist colored them correct oh. <laughs> so Thor has a red cape and the blue dots everything it's completely there and it went out like that and yeah. nobody spotted it to the point that I, I certainly saw it when the issue came out I went oh my god that's really funny I'm never telling anybody involved that I did it <laughs> Uh, and because uh, I don't think the other would have been happy about that, no. but yeah, Thor and Odin are apparently DC characters now. Yeah. I did have I did have uh, uh, Mr. Spock attend uh, a baseball game when Nolan Ryan was pitching one of his seven no hitters. That was I did that for a sports comic publisher or whatever. So, <laughs> well, Leonard Nimoy gets out. Yeah, I figured he gets around. Why not? I've done that a few times where you put the wrong person in the background mm -hmm. just for fun. And uh, I've oh, the worst one I ever did. Well, this is back in the Legion days again. Clearly, I was not supposed to be working on the Legion. Um, <laughs> uh, I had the Legion go to an art museum, and uh, I'm no kids in the room. One of the uh, uh, I, I I don't know how many people here have seen it, but there's a very specifically famous dildo that has a beaver on one part of it. And it's a famous, it's a, I forget what the name of it, but it's a very famous dildo. Um, so uh, in the art museum, there was a big 10-foot version sculpture of that uh, in the middle of this art museum that they were at. And if it was supposed to be alien art, so whatever alien art is, that's what it was. And again, I did that fully expecting Al Gordon to fix it. <laughs> They left that in pretty straight. So aliens worship dildos is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to actually wrap it up. It's 2 o'clock now. Yeah. Okay, okay, you know, anytime anyone on a panel says alien worships dildos, wrap it up right yeah. there. Because <laughs> hey, it's wandered time. way afield. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate you <laughs> And I, I guess technically that... Well, we did cover Canadian stuff, I guess, 20%, so that covers his content, I guess. So, <laughs> and, of course, everyone here was a little high because you're always slightly higher in Canada. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of the 2018 Niagara Falls Comic Con.
Please like, comment and subscribe to see more, and let us know below what you think of this video. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.